Hey friends, welcome back to Tora Led Homestead. Thanks so much for stopping by today to watch. Today we are on episode three of Prep Day Radio. If you are new to Prep Day Radio, basically I just put together a little video of stuff to read to you guys and talk to you about. It's really more for listening to, so you don't necessarily need to watch me. I'm just gonna talk to you for a while. Um, so it's more, kind of a listen while you work sort of a thing. So you can just put it on and go do whatever work you need to do today for Prep Day, whether it's working on your meals or your laundry folding or whatever it is you're doing just kind of take me along and listen and something to kind of encourage you and help you get through your work today for prep day if prep day is new to you and you're not exactly sure what we're talking about it's basically the day that we set aside to prepare so that we can take a proper shabbat a proper sabbath rest on saturday um, where we will not have to work and do things that you know get in the way of our restful Shabbat day. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go to my Prep Day Radio number one. I talk all about Prep Day. Um, I show you where it's biblical, and I show you, I talk to you about you know what sort of things I do on this day to get my home ready to observe the Shabbat. So um, you can check that out if you're interested. Otherwise, we will get started. So today's topics center around knowing ourselves and interacting with other people. Um, I hope that these will be encouraging. They're kind of a self-reflection sort of a thing. All right, so we'll get right into it. I'm going to begin talking to you guys about seasons. This month marks a year since I lost my dad. Um, since losing my dad on January 14th, I've also gained a daughter-in-law when my son was married in March, and then I've also become a grandmother when their baby was born in December. This year has been a year of ups and downs for sure for me. I have learned so much this year about being vulnerable, about being gentle with myself, um, and understanding the seasons of life and so that's kind of what I want to talk about to start off this video the seasons of life so 14 years ago I started a blog and I named it hope in every season i had gone through some pretty heavy stuff in my marriage um, and my relationship with my dad um, I'd suffered a miscarriage we moved to a new town I was expecting my seventh child I had just left some ministry things like a whole bunch of crazy stuff had gone on and I definitely experienced some seasons of life but I remember telling myself that there was going to be many more good and bad seasons to come my way. And I wanted to remember that Yahweh offered me hope in all of those different good and bad seasons. And so that name, Hope in Every Season, seems really appropriate. And I kept it for quite a few years on my blog. So let's back up to the beginning of my adulting years. Um, I started off teaching at a Christian school just a week after our wedding. Um, after my honeymoon, I came home and they said, do you want to teach at the Christian school? And I was like, sure. And then shortly after that, I added to that joining the worship team. Then I added to that weekend and evening children's ministry. And then I added to that women's ministry. And I just kind of became heavily involved in everything. Um, everything that I could find to do, right? And so because of that, my home was a disaster all of the time. Um, we ate a lot of drive through and a lot of takeout meals. Um, I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants, really. But there was good things being done here. Um, I went on like that for about 10 years um, and then one day my circumstance changed and I just gave the whole thing up. I stayed home with my kids, I taught myself homemaking skills, I focused on homeschooling, um, I focused on refining my character, I focused on my marriage and communication with my husband. I started just kind of hermiting away and I wasn't much involved in any kind of outside ministry at all other than my own blog. And I went like that for about 10 years. And then one day my circumstances changed again and I really started feeling led to sort of dip my toe into those waters of the outside world. Um, the Father gave me a message and a platform on which to share it and he gave me a zealousness for his word and for his ways that has made me really bold. So I'm still kind of learning how to balance like the zealousness with gentleness so I'm like not offending everyone um, but we'll talk more about that later. Who knows how long this season of life will go on until the Father puts me in a different place. But all of these seasons, none of them are, you know, better or worse than another. They're just all different. And the Father used them all for a good purpose. I really want to remain pliable so that the Father can just kind of like move me in and out of, you know, whatever season that he wants me to without being, having this roadblock of my own, you know, stubborn resistance. And um, I just want to remain moldable, right? So a few years ago, um, this guy that I follow online, he and I turned 40 at the same time. 
and we have very similar lifestyles. We're both homeschool. We have large families. Our kids are about the same age. Like we just kind of have a similar situation. And he wrote up this post about how in the next decade would be like the biggest changes his family would ever see. And as I was reading through that, I was like, wow, that's totally the same thing for my family. Um, by the end of my 40s, all of my kids will have graduated. I will not be a homeschooling mom anymore. At the end of my 40s, all of my children will be adults, so I won't be the mother of children anymore. Um, I won't be making very many decisions for them, and the decisions that they make won't affect me like they do now. Most of my children will have moved out by then, and my house is going to be much quieter. Any of the children who are still here are kind of going to be, you know, pursuing their own things, and so I'll have all that quiet time that I'm always craving. My husband will be older and grayer and more vulnerable to the things that life throws at us, but so will I. And I'm already seeing this, right? This last year has been full of the most change in, that I have ever experienced, probably since the year that my parents divorced and I had to go to three different schools in three different towns in one year. But even then, I don't think it was as tough as 2022 has been on me. Um, I can honestly say that throughout this big year of change, though, I truly remained pliable as much as I could. The Father showed me so much this year. It's really been a great season of growth for me, and I think that I approached all of the ups and downs probably the best that I really could. Um, I don't feel like I put up walls for Him, right? I don't. I feel like I was movable <laughs> the best that I could be in my humanness. I think that it's important that we accept though that we will move in and out of seasons. The really important thing though is that we recognize when it's time to move. I don't want my season to become my identity. So let me explain what I mean by that. So a long time ago, probably close to 20 years ago, one of my good friends um, asked me, I had many children at the time, I was having children um, you know, once a year or <laughs> close to it. And my friend was like, do you think that you find your identity in having all of these children? And I was so offended. I got so mad at her <laughs> for saying that because I was like, ah, what a horrible thing to say. Of course not. Of course I don't. And I was really mad at the time, but the thing is, is she was actually right. Um, I had nine children and one miscarriage in 13 years. And then one day I just stopped. And then for the last 10 years, I have struggled with the emotions that are involved in infertility. Um, but for someone with nine children to talk about infertility is kind of laughable, right? People don't really take me seriously, although it is a, a very heartbreaking thing for me that I struggle with. And I realized that, you know, I had let that season become my identity because once it was taken away from me, I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know what to do with myself. And it took several years for the father to really refine me and help me to see that having those children, that was not my identity, right? Um, that he, that he, my identity could only be found in him. And, you know, he led me into a new season and a wonderful season that I am now able to walk in because I don't have young children to care for. So leaving you up to God is really easy when everything's going your way, right? But when it starts getting hard and you're still leaving it up to God, that's when it really tests us and we know whether or not our motivations are right, right? And where are we finding our identity? Sometimes our seasons are for healing or for contemplation, and sometimes they can be really short breaks even that they just kind of allow you to process through something, right? A good thing or a bad thing. Sometimes we get knocked down and, you know, everyone says, you get knocked down, you get right back up again. <laughs> There's even a song about it, right? That's what everybody says to do, just get right back up again. But I think it's okay actually to stay down for a little while in some cases. Um, we learn lessons there when we get knocked down and we're just taking the time to completely heal. We give the Father that quiet time to work in us, right? And He lifts us up in His timing. Sometimes if we just get right back up again, some of that stuff just sort of gets stuffed down, right? And it eventually will resurface, but it will lead to bitterness and a struggle to forgive. Sometimes we need to be fully in that low place and allow the Father to help us to work some stuff out. And then sometimes our seasons are for rest and for rejuvenation. Um, we can find ourselves in these wonderful mountaintop situations. I have a tendency though to kind of tread lightly 
during these easier seasons of life. Um, I'm kind of always waiting for the other shoe to drop and for everything to get bad again, right? I have a hard time being vulnerable and just enjoying the season that I'm in because I'm just waiting for that bad thing to happen. And, and I don't want it to catch me off guard, right? I want to be in control of that situation. I think though that it's healthier to realize that hard times will come again, um, but these seasons of joy are given to refresh and restore us. Yesterday I was texting with one of my sons and trying to encourage him and I heard this uh, phrase in my spirit. It said, the enemy manufactures stress for us where there is none. When we start getting bogged down with all of the, you know, what ifs, we miss the season of is not. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you're constantly, what if this happens? What if this happens? You fail to recognize, yeah, but that is not happening right now. Um, we tend to, you know, overthink things and worry about what might come our way. And it manufactures all the stress when there really doesn't need to be any at all. Do you ever find yourself, you know, maybe um, you've been thinking through some things or reading through some things or whatever, and then you, all of a sudden you stop and you realize, I am really stressed out, but you can't remember why you're really stressed out. You know, you scroll back through Facebook, what, did I read something stressful today? And you're trying to remember, what is it that is stressing me out? Okay, that's a sign that we're probably letting the enemy stress us out when there's not really any stress there to be found, right? And we just need to calm down, chill out, and be at peace. We really need to try to accept those gentle seasons and let them restore us and prepare us for the harder seasons that are going to come. The Bible shows us that there is hope to be found in good seasons and in difficult ones. So I'm going to read two portions of scripture that I think really give a good word picture on each of these good or bad seasons. So if you're able to right now, close your eyes and imagine these things happening in real life. And remember that the Father brings hope in both circumstances. The first portion comes from Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, chapter two, verses 10 through 13. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come, the cooing of doves is heard in our land, the fig tree forms its early fruit, the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. And the second one is Psalm 27, a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread? When the wicked came upon me to devour my flesh, my enemies and foes stumbled and fell. Though an army encamps around me, my heart will not fear. Though a war breaks out against me, I will keep my trust. One thing I have asked of the Lord, this is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will hide me in his shelter. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be held high above the enemies around me. At his tabernacle, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, my voice when I call. Be merciful and answer me. My heart said, seek his face. Your face, O Lord, I will seek. Hide not your face from me, nor turn away your servant in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or forsake me, O God of my salvation. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. Still I am certain to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Wait patiently for the Lord. I think that we can remain more pliable to move with his seasons when we remember that we can trust him in every season. And since I am still in that season of having children at home, I've been thinking a lot lately about what my kids actually need from me as a stay-at-home homeschooling parent. I'm in my 19th year of homeschooling, so you'd think I'd kind of have this down pat, right? But the world has changed a lot in 19 years, and so have I. And so much of the stuff that used to be important just seems to be like fluff to me now. I'm feeling this need to transition to a bigger focus on the Bible and the basic life skills. So here's an article that I wrote for my former blog about five years ago. 
I revised it quite a bit to reflect the knowledge and experience that I've gained since then and I hope this encourages you. One day I was in the meat section at Aldi and a couple of women in their 20s were looking at all the different cuts of meat. They were trying to decide what to cook for a get together and one of them said, steak sounds so good right now. The other said, yeah, I know, I wish I knew how to cook it. The first girl agreed that she also didn't know how to cook it. Then they had the same conversation about fish and when I was finishing picking out the meat I needed, they were still trying to decide on something to buy. Not because they weren't sure what sounded best, but because they weren't sure how to cook any of it. So many parents are doing a huge disservice to their children without ever meaning to. We teach our daughters that they should focus more on their brains than pretty things. We tell sons to get out of the house and get a real job, but then we tell them that they can be anything they want to be. Some encourage their children to pursue a college degree and a career. Many who are stay-at-home moms themselves set their daughters on track for employment outside the home and think that they will have a better life. Many men remember growing up with harsh fathers and try to go easier on their own sons. I'm not here to debate the pros and cons of any of this, but what I want to talk to you about is homemaking skills. In the pursuit to grow our children's academic brains, many parents are missing out on the opportunity to train them in basic household management. Whether my daughter goes on to be a career woman or a full-time homemaker, and whether my son finds himself a good woman or lives the single life, they're going to need basic life skills. Do our kids know how to prepare a meal or even a portion of one from scratch with any combination of ingredients available to them? Can they shop for a week's worth of groceries on a budget? Do they know how to change a diaper, check a temperature, recognize the signs of a baby in distress? Are they familiar with using a toilet plunger? Can they recognize mold and mildew growing on a shower curtain? Do they know when food is spoiled? Can they recognize when a cut of meat is cooked enough to see eat safely? Would they be able to tell if their house was infested with fleas from their dog or with cockroaches? Well, here's a bigger question for parents. Do we know how to do these things? These are all basic life skills that everyone will need whether they work outside the home or decide to stay home. Many parents are especially concerned about preparing their daughters for a life without a man should they be abandoned by their partner or not marry at all. However, they mistakenly focus on her education too heavily at the expense of her life skills. I can't tell you how many women my age have their husbands change the flat tire, fix the leaky faucet, change the moldy shower curtain, and honestly, I do too. But if the argument is that we're training daughters for a potential life of singleness, why are we not focusing on the things that she'll actually need to know to get through life? And furthermore, why do we assume that our male children will just automatically know these things because they're guys? I know we all have different lifestyles that necessitate certain conveniences at certain times. Yet I think it's really important that we go back to learning some basic skills, even if we don't actually need them right now. The world is very volatile and we should not be so ignorant as to believe we can never go backwards in technology. A good student of history and archaeology will find evidence that this probably isn't the first technological revolution of humanity. I just want to give a general encouragement to pray about how we can better train our children to do the basic life things that we all encounter day by day. As we strive to keep up with the modern world, let's remember the things we consider old-fashioned is the way of life that most of humanity has gone back to as kingdoms rise and fall. If you feel inadequate, ask someone for help. If you're local, ask me for help. There are many tutorials and videos online and on blogs for anything you'd ever want to learn. And I want to interject here, even though this isn't in my notes, that there is a whole concept in Titus 2 that talks about people teaching one another and mentoring one another. So if you find that you're not in a situation where you actually have people in your household that need to learn these skills, you definitely have people in your fellowship, in your family, in your community. There are people around who need to know this stuff. And so maybe if you know some of these things, pass them on to someone else. Get a group together. Maybe you can get a hold of a local homeschool co-op and see if they would want to get some kids together to learn how to cook or sew or something. Um, or learn, learn how to you know change a tire or change the oil in your car or recognize when there's a problem with your car or, learn baby skills, those sorts of things um, are really needed in today's society. We don't live the way we used to where, you know, families, generations all live together and watch the seasons of life going by. So I just think it's really important that if we have those skills that we pass them on. Family traditions, cozy homes, simple life pleasures, these are not things of the past. They carry on from generation to generation through the diligence 
of pe parents teaching their children and of communities teaching one another. Whether working outside the home or full-time homemakers, all of us are the hearts of our homes. All right, so speaking of life skills, another really important one is communication. Lately, I have been reminded how important it is to communicate well. So I wasn't really taught these skills growing up, you know, at home or at school, really, and my marriage really suffered in the beginning because Jamie and I both really struggled to communicate well. Um, there was just a lot of fighting and fit throwing <laughs> and immaturity going on because we didn't know how to make the other one see what we were trying to say, right? If they didn't really get us. And, and a lot of it was just about learning, you know, growing up together and, and learning about each other. But we've learned so much about communication. I've really thought myself to be a pretty good communicator these last, you know, 10 or 15 years. But I recently discovered that I've got a blind spot. I've realized that I kind of have a weakness sometimes with feeling people out, right? I often communicate on a level and a mentality that makes sense to me. But I don't always try to be super conscious about the level and the mentality of the person that I'm communicating to. Too. Okay, so by level, I don't mean like some kind of hierarchy of intelligence or maturity or whatever. I mean more like a mindset. You know, what is this person's mindset? What is their worldview? What are their personal circumstances that are going to, you know, come into play here during this time of communication with them? And you can't always know that, but we should always be careful to try to see, try to figure that out, right? So I'm usually very blunt and straightforward in my communication. I want to get to the heart of the issue immediately. Let's take care of the problem. Everyone agree that we're going to do better the next time. Let's wrap it all up. All in a day's work, right? But not everyone can or will communicate like that. Um, and maybe that's not always the right way to do things. Sometimes I need to be more sensitive to the fact that that person may have taken offenses that I didn't even realize were there. Um, maybe they're not just all about black and white, fix it, you know, we're done. Um, maybe they're not used to communicating in the way that I'm attempting. And maybe what I'm seeing as fix it as soon as possible, they might be seeing as an abrupt confrontation and they feel like they're being attacked. I find that I can be impatient when it comes to communication and that can make other people feel like I'm just having this conversation for my own benefit and not for the mutual benefit of everyone involved. And maybe I am. It's really important that we communicate with ourselves too to sort of examine our motivations, right? Communicating wrongly makes up a huge portion of arguments. Um, so here are some things that I have learned about communicating well. The first one is to listen to hear and not to speak. Okay, so we've all been in these situations with someone and we've probably been the someone also. When you're t when the person is talking to you, right, and you're like, yeah, but, yeah, but, okay, but, okay, 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 but, and we, we're trying to interject. We're always wanting to interject, right? Or even even if we're not saying things, our mannerisms are, we're jumpy, right? And we're trying to say something, and we're raising our hand, and we're making gestures, and we're or we're looking off into space, and we're rolling our eyes, or we're making all of these signals that we have something to say. But what we're really saying is, I don't care what you have to say, I want to speak, I want to be heard. And we're refusing to hear the other person. So we need to listen to hear. We need to actually hear what they're saying. It doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but listen to hear what they're saying. And then hopefully they'll listen to hear what you're saying, right? Secondly, we need to be careful that we don't automatically take offense. Um, we need to be humbly willing to learn something in the conversation that we're having. Um, sometimes when someone is, you know, communicating something to us where, you know, we may be in the wrong or they perceive us to be in the wrong, sometimes we can sort of clam up, you know, we can get embarrassed or we can get intimidated and, and we, we just take offense. But we need to be careful to realize that we may actually be uh, in the wrong and we may actually be able to learn something either way. Also, don't give long speeches. <laughs> I have a tendency to do this, um, and some of my kids do as well when they are in charge of their siblings for the day. Um, you will lose people if you just go on and on. So, you know, there are times when I'm getting better about it, but, you know, I'll, I'll be wanting to lay something out to my husband and explain to him what happened and how it made me feel, and this is what he should do to make it better. And I, and I go into this whole thing, and it's like 20 minutes. <laughs> And then at the end, I'm like, why aren't you saying anything? <laughs> why won't you respond? 
you don't want to communicate with me because you won't respond. And he's like, I had something to say 17 minutes ago, but you've jumped from 45 topics. I can't remember, right? So we need to just be careful, stop, pause, allow the other to speak. If it's truly important to the conversation, I believe the father will help you remember it if you ask him. Um, sometimes, you know, we can just forget a lot of the stuff we said if we just take a minute to let the other person respond without going into this long, long speech for them, right? Another good thing to do is to ask for clarification. You know, when someone says something to you, ask them, did you mean to say this? this is how I took it, or this is how I am interpreting your tone of voice, or whatever. Ask for clarification, because that's, you know, that really is what communication is about, is understanding what the other one is trying to say to you. So you need to make sure that you're hearing what they meant to say. On the flip side, sometimes it's good to ask, uh, what did you hear me say? Now, you gotta be careful because this one can sound patronizing sometimes, you know, what do you think I said? Hmm? Did you not understand me? You, you don't wanna come across like that, but you know, if you, if you communicate something and then you can say, now, what is it that you just heard from me? I wanna make sure that you are understanding me in the way that I meant to communicate to you, right? That one's a little iffy, you gotta be careful, but it is good to clarify before moving too far forward in a discussion. It's important to remember also that it's okay for you to defend yourself, okay? You just need to be fair and honest. Um, just because someone has a lot of things to say to you and, and maybe they have, you know, they use big words and they <laughs> have some, you know, points that sound so, you know, right on, it may not actually be that you need to make changes or that you have done something wrong or that you have offended or whatever. You might actually be in the right. Just be careful to be fair and to be honest with yourself and to at least take what they have to say into consideration, right? And then when you, if you truly feel like you need to defend yourself, do so in a way that is respectful and, um, and gentle, right? It's important to understand that sometimes people are speaking from their emotions, right? So the things that they're saying might not be exactly accurate if they are speaking from a place of deep emotion. Maybe they're angry, maybe they're, you know, disappointed, maybe they're hurt, um, maybe they're really excited and they exaggerate. Um, so sometimes you might have to come back to a discussion later after emotions have settled down. You could really get to the heart of things. Most of all, I think this is the most important one, then make sure that when the discussion is done, it's done, okay? When you're finished, you're finished, because love keeps no record of wrongs. So when you are having a discussion with someone and you're working something out, make sure that it's all worked out, both of you agree that it's worked out, and then you both agree to be done now, right? To let it go. Um, a lot of times we can say, oh yeah, yeah, I forgive, um, we're done, it's over, but then something else comes up and then we pull all that stuff back out again, right? And we, and we get all that yuck back out again, throw it back up in the air to be debated on again when it should have been left alone because you worked it out and love keeps no record of wrongs. It's definitely an area that requires prayer and discernment, right? I can have all the words and then communication skills, but if it's not being received in the way that I meant, then it's not really going to lead to any kind of reconciliation or problem solving or, or the other, or us understanding one another at all. But on the flip side, sometimes we do end up dealing with someone who can't let go of hurt and, and they choose to maintain their point of view on a situation and they don't really want to communicate, right? They just want to live in their place of hurt. And in that case, we can't change anyone's mind if they don't want to be changed, right? We can't compromise with someone who doesn't want to compromise. and We can only be responsible for ourselves and our behavior. So it's really important that we go as far as we're able to rec you know, find reconciliation, to find understanding, and to communicate well. But at some point, it's okay just to stop communication and let the father take care of the situation in the way that he knows best, right? Because there may be some things that need to be taken care of in the other person's life or in your own life that will hinder you from actually being able to completely get through these, this uh, you know, issue that you're having. But the important thing is that we make every attempt to communicate in a way that honors the Father and let Him take care of hearts in the way that He knows best. Okay friends, well I hope that was encouraging to you. Um, now I'm going to transition and read to you from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. We are on chapter 6. Again, if you need to catch up, you can go to episodes one and two of our Prep Day Radio to get the first parts of the book or just jump in here because it's really great no matter where you jump in. Um, but I'm going to start in with chapter six. 
The ladies of Longbourn soon waited on those of Netherfield. The visit was returned in due form. Miss Bennet's pleasing manners grew on the goodwill of Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and though the mother was found to be intolerable and the younger sisters not worth speaking to, a wish of being better acquainted with them was expressed toward the two eldest. By Jane this attention was received with the greatest pleasure, but Elizabeth still saw superciliousness in their treatment of everybody, hardly accepting even her sister, and could not like them. Though their kindness to Jane, such as it was, had a value as arising in all probability from the influence of their brother's admiration, it was generally evident whenever they met that he did admire her, and to her it was equally evident that Jane was yielding to the preference which she had begun to entertain for him from the first, and was in a way to be very much in love. But she considered with pleasure that it was not likely to be discovered by the world in general, since Jane united with great strength of feeling a composure of temper and a uniform cheerfulness of manner, which would guard her from the suspicions of the impertinent. She mentioned this to her friend Miss Lucas. It may perhaps be pleasant, replied Charlotte, to be able to impose on the public in such a case, but it is sometimes a disadvantage to be so very guarded. If a woman conceals her affection with the same skill from the object of it, she may lose the opportunity of fixing him, and it will then be but poor consolation to believe the world equally in the dark. There is so much of gratitude or vanity in almost every attachment that it is not safe to leave any to itself. We can all begin freely, a slight preference is natural enough, but there are very few of us who have heart enough to be really in love without encouragement. In nine cases out of ten, a woman had better show more affection than she feels. Bingley likes your sister undoubtedly, but he may never do more than like her if she does not help him on. But she does help him on as much as her nature will allow. If I can perceive her regard for him, he must be a simpleton indeed not to discover it too. Remember, Eliza, that he does not know Jane's disposition as you do. But if a woman is partial to a man and does not endeavor to conceal it, he must find out. Perhaps he must, if he sees enough of her. But though Bingley and Jane meet tolerably often, it is never for many hours together. And as they always see each other in large mixed parties, it is impossible that every moment should be employed in conversing together. Jane should therefore make the most of every half hour in which she can command his attention. When she is secure of him, there will be leisure for falling in love as much as she chooses. Your plan is a good one, replied Elizabeth, where nothing is in question but the desire of being well married, and if I were determined to get a rich husband, or any husband, I dare say I should adopt it. But these are not Jane's feelings, she is not acting by design, as yet she cannot even be certain of the degree of her own regard, nor of its reasonableness. She has known him only a fortnight. She danced four dances with him at Meryton. She saw him one morning at his own house, and has since dined in company with him four times is not quite enough to make her understand his character. Not as you represent it. Had she merely dined with him, she might only have discovered whether he had a good appetite. But you must remember that four evenings have been also spent together, and four evenings may do a great deal. Yes, these four evenings have enabled them to ascertain that they both like Vington better than Commerce. But with respect to any other leading characteristic, I do not imagine that much has been unfolded. Well, said Charlotte. I wish Jane success with all my heart, and if she were married to him tomorrow, I should think she had as good a chance of happiness as if she were to be studying his character for a twelvemonth. Happiness in marriage is entirely a matter of chance. If the dispositions of the parties are ever so well known to each other, or ever so similar beforehand, it does not advance their felicity in the least. They always continue to grow sufficiently unlike afterwards, to have their share of vexation, and it is better to know as little as possible of the defects of the person with whom you are to pass your life. You make me laugh, Charlotte, but it is not sound, you know it is not sound, and that you would never act in this way yourself. Occupied in observing Mr. Bingley's attention to her sister, Elizabeth was far from suspecting that she herself was becoming an object of some interest in the eyes of his friend. Mr. Darcy had at first scarcely allowed her to be pretty. He had looked at her without admiration at the ball, and when they next met he looked at her only to criticize. But no sooner had he made it clear to himself and his friends that she had hardly a good feature in her face than he began to find it was rendered uncommonly intelligent by the beautiful expression of her dark eyes. 
To this discovery succeeded some others equally mortifying. Though he had detected with a critical eye more than one failure of perfect symmetry in her form, he was forced to acknowledge her figure to be light and pleasing, and in spite of his asserting that her manners were not those of the fashionable world, he was caught by their easy playfulness. Of this she was perfectly unaware. To her, he was only the man who had made himself agreeable nowhere, and who had not thought her handsome enough to dance with. He began to wish to know more of her, and as a step towards conversing with her himself, attended to her conversation with others. His doing so drew her notice. It was at Sir William Lucas's where a large party were assembled. What does Mr. Darcy mean, she said to Charlotte, by listening to my conversation with Colonel Forster? That is a question which only Mr. Darcy can answer. But if he does it any more, I shall certainly let him know that I see what he is about. He has a very satirical eye, and if I do not begin by being impertinent myself, I shall soon grow afraid of him. On his approaching them soon afterwards, though without seeming to have any intention of speaking, Miss Lucas defied her friend to mention such a subject to him, which immediately provoking Elizabeth to do it, she turned to him and said, did you not think, Mr. Darcy, that I expressed myself uncommonly well just now when I was teasing Colonel Forster to give us a ball at Meryton? With great energy, but it is a subject which always makes a lady energetic. You are severe on us. It will be her turn soon to be teased, said Miss Lucas. I am going to open the instrument, Eliza, and you know what follows. You are a very strange creature by way of a friend, always wanting me to play and sing before anybody and everybody. If my vanity had taken a musical turn, you would have been invaluable. But as it is, I would really rather not sit down before those who must be in the habit of hearing the best performers. On Miss Lucas's persevering, however, she added, Very well. If it must be so, it must. And gravely glancing at Mr. Darcy, There is a fine old saying which everybody here is of course familiar with, Keep your breath to cool your porridge, and I shall keep mine to swell my song. Her performance was pleasing, though by no means capital. After a song or two, and before she could reply to the entreaties of several that she would sing again, she was eagerly succeeded at the instrument by her sister Mary, who having, in consequence of being the only plain one in the family, worked hard for knowledge and accomplishments, was always impatient for display. Mary had neither genius nor taste, and though vanity had given her application, it had given her likewise a pedantic air and a conceited manner which would have injured a higher degree of excellence than she had reached. Elizabeth, easy and unaffected, had been listened to with much more pleasure, though not playing half so well, and Mary at the end of the long concerto was glad to purchase praise and gratitude by Scotch and Irish heirs at the request of her younger sisters, who with some of the Lucases and two or three officers joined eagerly in dancing at one end of the room. Mr. Darcy stood near them in silent indignation at such a mode of passing the evening, to the exclusion of all conversation, and was too much engrossed by his own thoughts to perceive that Sir William Lucas was his neighbor, till so Sir William Lucas began. What a charming amusement for young people this is, Mr. Darcy. There is nothing like dancing after all. I consider it as one of the first refinements of polished societies. Certainly, sir, and it has the advantage also of being in vogue among the less polished societies of the world. Every savage can dance. Sir William only smiled. Your friend performs delightfully, he continued, after a pause on seeing Bingley join the group. And I doubt not that you are an adept in the science yourself, Mr. Bur Mr. Darcy. You saw me dance at Meryton, I believe, sir. Yes, indeed, and received no inconsiderable pleasure from the sight. Do you often dance at St. James's? Never, sir. Do you not think it would be a proper compliment to the place? It is a compliment which I never pay to any place if I can avoid it. You have a house in town, I conclude. Mr. Darcy bowed. I had once some thoughts of fixing in town myself, for I am fond of superior society, but I did not feel quite certain that the air of London would agree with Lady Lucas. He paused in hopes of an answer, but his companion was not disposed to make any, and Elizabeth at that instant moving toward them, he was struck with the notion of doing a very gallant thing, and called out to her, My dear old Miss Eliza, why are you not dancing? Mr. Darcy, you must allow me to present this young lady to you as a very desirable partner. You cannot refuse to dance, I am sure, when so much beauty is before you. 
and taking her hand, he would have given it to Mr. Darcy, who, though extremely surprised, was not unwilling to receive it, when she instantly drew back and said with some discomposure to Sir William, Indeed, sir, I have not the least intention of dancing. I entreat you not to suppose that I move this way in order to beg for a partner. Mr. Darcy, with grave propriety, requested to be allowed the honor of her hand, but in vain. Elizabeth was determined, nor did Sir William at all shake her purpose by his attempt at persuasion. You excel so much in the dance, Miss Eliza, that it is cruel to deny me the happiness of seeing you, and though this gentleman dislikes the amusement in general, he can have no objection, I am sure, to oblige us for one half hour. Mr. Darcy is all politeness, said Elizabeth, smiling. He is indeed, but considering the inducement, my dear Miss Eliza, we cannot wonder at his complacence, for who would object to such a partner? Elizabeth looked archly and turned away. Her resistance had not injured her with a gentleman, and he was thinking of her with some complacency, when thus accosted by Miss Beamley. I can guess the subject of your reverie. I should imagine not. You are considering how insupportable it would be to pass many evenings in this manner, in such society, and indeed I am quite of your opinion. I was never more annoyed. The insipidity, and yet the noise, the nothingness, and yet the self-importance of all these people? What would I give to hear your strictures on them? Your conjecture is totally wrong, I assure you. My mind was more agreeably engaged. I have been meditating on the very great pleasure which a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman can bestow. Miss Bingley immediately fixed her eyes on his face, and desired he would tell her what lady had the credit of inspiring such reflections. Mr. Darcy replied with great intrepidity, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, replied Miss Bingley. I am all astonishment. How long has she been such a favorite, and pray when am I to wish you joy? That is exactly the question which I expected you to ask. A lady's imagination is very rapid. It jumps from admiration to love, from love to matrimony in a moment. I knew you would be wishing me joy. Nay, if you are so serious about it, I shall consider the matter as absolutely settled. You will have a charming mother-in-law indeed, and of course she will always be at Pemberley with you. He listened to her with perfect indifference, while she chose to entertain herself in this manner, and as his composure convinced her that all was safe, her wit flowed long. Chapter 7 Mr. Bennet's property consisted almost entirely in an estate of two thousand a year, which unfortunately for his daughters was entailed, in default of heirs male, on a distant relation, and their mother's fortune, though ample for her situation in life, could but ill supply the deficiency of his. Her father had been an attorney in Meryton, and had left her four thousand pounds. She had a sister married to a Mr. Phillips, who had been a clerk to their father, and succeeded him in the business and a brother settled in London in a respectable line of trade. The village of Longbourn was only one mile from Meryton, a most convenient distance for the young ladies, who were usually tempted thither three or four times a week, to pay their duty to their aunt, and to a milliner's shop just over the way. The two youngest of the family, Catherine and Lydia, were particularly frequent in these attentions, their minds were more vacant than their sisters, and when nothing better offered, a walk to Meryton was necessary to amuse their morning hours and furnish conversation for the evening, and however bare of news the country in general might be, they always contrived to learn some from their aunt. At present, indeed, they were well supplied both with news and happiness by the recent arrival of a militia regiment in the neighborhood. It was to remain the whole winter, and Meryton was the headquarters. Their visits to Mrs. Phillips were now productive of the most interesting intelligence. Every day added something to their knowledge of the officers' names and connections. Their lodgings were not along a secret, and at length they began to know the officers themselves. Mr. Phillips visited them all, and this opened to his nieces a source of felicity unknown before. They could talk of nothing but officers and Mr. Bingley's large fortune, the mention of which gave animation to their mother, was worthless in their eyes when opposed to the regimentals of an ensign. After listening one morning to their effusions on the subject, Mr. Bennet coolly observed, From all that I can collect by your manner of talking, you must be two of the silliest girls in the country. I have suspected it some time, but I am now convinced. 
Catherine was disconcerted and made no answer, but Lydia, with perfect indifference, continued to express her admiration of Captain Carter and her hope of seeing him in the course of the day as he was going the next morning to London. "'I am astonished, my dear,' said Mrs. Bennet, "'that you should be so ready to think your own children silly. "'If I wish to think slightingly of anybody's children, "'it should not be of my own, however.' "'If my children are silly, I must hope to be always sensible of it.' "'Yes, but as it happens, they are all of them very clever.' "'This is the only point, I flatter myself, on which we do not agree. "'I had hoped that our sentiments coincided in every particular, "'but I must so far differ from you as to think our two youngest daughters uncommonly foolish.' "'My dear Mr. Bennet, you must not expect such girls to have the sense of their father and mother. "'When they get to our age, I dare say they will not think about officers any more than we do. "'I remember the time when I liked a red coat myself very well. "'And, indeed, so I do still at my heart. "'And if a smart young colonel with five or six thousand a year should want one of my girls, "'I shall not say nay to him, and I thought Colonel Forster looked very becoming the other night at Sir William's and his regimentals.' Mamma cried Lydia, my aunt says that Colonel Forster and Captain Carter do not go so often to Miss, Miss Watson's as they did when they first came. She sees them now very often standing in Clark's library. Mrs. Bennet was prevented replying by the entrance of the footman with a note from Miss Bennet. It came from Netherfield, and the servant waited for an answer. Mrs. Bennet's eyes sparkled with pleasure, and she was eagerly calling out while her daughter read, well, Jane, who is it from? What is it about? What does he say? Well, Jane, make haste and tell us. Make haste, my love. It is from Mrs. Bingley, said Jane, and then read it aloud. My dear friend, if you are not so compassionate as to dine today with Louisa and me, we shall be in danger of hating each other for the rest of our lives. For a whole day's tete-a-tete -tete between two women can never end without a quarrel. Come as soon as you can on the receipt of this. My brother and the gentleman are to dine with the officers. Yours ever, Caroline Bingley. With the officers, cried Lydia. I wonder my aunt did not tell us of that. Dining out, said Mrs. Bennet. That is very unlucky. Can I have the carriage? asked Jane. No, my dear, you had better go on horseback because it seems likely to rain, and then you must stay all night. That would be a good scheme, said Elizabeth, if you were sure that they would not offer to send her home. Oh, but the gentlemen will have Mr. Bingley's chaise to go to Meryton, and the hearse have no horses to theirs. I had much rather go in the coach. But, my dear, your father cannot spare the horses, I'm sure. They are wanted in the farm, Mr. Bennet, are they not? They are wanted in the farm much oftener than I can get them. But if you have got them today, said Elizabeth, my mother's purpose will be answered. She did at last exhort from her father an acknowledgment that the horses were engaged. Jane was therefore obliged to go on horseback, and her mother attended her to the door with many cheerful prognostics of a bad day. Her hopes were answered. Jane had not been gone long before it rained hard. Her sisters were uneasy for her, but her mother was delighted. The rain continued the whole evening without intermission. Jane certainly could not come back. This was a lucky idea of mine indeed, said Mrs. Bennet more than once, as if the credit of making it rain were all her own. Till the next morning, however, she was not aware of the felicity of her contrivance. Breakfast was scarcely over when a servant from Netherfield brought the following note for Elizabeth. My dearest Lizzie, I find myself very unwell this morning, which I suppose is to be imputed to my getting wet through it through yesterday. My kind friends will not hear of my returning home till I am better. They insist also on my seeing Mr. Jones, therefore do not be alarmed if you should hear of his having been to me, and excepting a sore throat and headache, there is not much the matter with me. Yours, Jane. Well, my dear, said Mr. Bennet, when Elizabeth had read the note aloud, if your daughter should have a dangerous fit of illness, if she should die, it would be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley and under your orders. Oh, I am not at all afraid of her dying. People do not die of little trifling colds. She will be taken good care of. As long as she stays there, it is all very well. I would go and see her if I could have the carriage. Elizabeth, feeling really anxious, was determined to go to her, though the carriage was not to be had. And as she was no horsewoman, walking was her only alternative. She declared her resolution. How can you be so silly, cried her mother, as to think of such a thing in all this dirt? You will not be fit to be seen when you get here. I shall be very fit to see Jane, which is all I want. Is this a hint to me, Lizzie, said her father, to send for the horses? 
No, indeed, I do not wish to avoid the walk. The distance is nothing when one has a motive. Only three miles. I shall be back by dinner. I admire the activity of your benevolence, observed Mary, but every impulse of feeling should be guided by reason, and in my opinion exertion should always be in proportion to what is required. We will go as far as Meryton with you, said Catherine and Lydia. Elizabeth accepted their company, and the three young ladies set off together. If we make haste, said Lydia as they walked along, perhaps we may see something of Captain Carter before he goes. In Meryton they parted, the two youngest repaired to the lodgings of one of the officer's wives, and Elizabeth continued her walk alone, crossing field after field at a quick pace, jumping over stiles and springing over puddles with impatient activity, and finding herself at last within view of the house with weary ankles, dirty stockings, and a face glowing with the warmth of exercise. She was shown into the breakfast parlor where all but Jane were assembled, and where her appearance created a great deal of surprise. That she should have walked three miles so early in the day, in such dirty weather, and by herself, was almost incredible to Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley, and Elizabeth was convinced that they held her in contempt for it. She was received, however, very politely by them, and in their brother's manners there was something better than politeness. There was good humor and kindness. Mr. Darcy said very little, and Mr. Hurst nothing at all. The former was divided between admiration at the brilliancy which exercise had given to her complexion, and doubt as to the occasions justifying her coming so far alone. The latter was thinking only of his breakfast. Her inquiries after her sister were not very favorably answered. Miss Bennet had slept ill, and though up, was very feverish, and not well enough to leave her room. Elizabeth was glad to be taken to her immediately, and Jane, who had only been withheld by the fear of giving alarm or inconvenience from expressing in her note how much she longed for such a visit, was delighted at her entrance. She was not equal, however, to much conversation, and was, when Miss Bingley left them together, could attempt little besides expressions of gratitude for the extraordinary kindness she was treated with. Elizabeth silently attended her. When breakfast was over, they were joined by the sisters, and Elizabeth began to like them herself when she saw how much affection and solicitude they showed for Jane. The apothecary came, and having examined his patient, said as might be supposed that she had caught a violent cold, and that they must endeavor to get the better of it, advised her to return to bed, and promised her some draughts. The advice was followed readily, for the feverish symptoms increased, and her head ached acutely. Elizabeth did not quit her room for a moment nor were the other ladies often absent. The gentlemen being out, they had in fact nothing to do elsewhere. When the clock struck three, Elizabeth felt that she must go, and un very unwillingly said so. Miss Bingley offered her the carriage, and she only wanted a little pressing to accept it, when Jane testified such concern in parting with her that Miss Bingley was obliged to convert the offer of the chase into an invitation to remain at Netherfield for the present. Elizabeth most thankfully consented, and a servant was dispatched to Longbourn to acquaint the family with her stay and to bring back a supply of clothes. All right, friends, I hope that this video has encouraged you and inspired you. I hope you're having a wonderful prep day and that you will have a beautiful and restful Shabbat. Thanks so much for stopping by. Share this with your friends if you'd like. It would be great to grow the community here on Charlotte Homestead, and I will see you soon. All right, bye-bye.